Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for checking out this video here on Show Style and Spirit. I am Ebony, of course. And as you can see from the title of this video, I will be giving my commentary on the most recent episode of Love and Marriage Huntsville, season seven, episode nine already. Time flies by. And of course, we'll be talking about things like Stormy's arrest, her mother Betty's dislike for Melody and how it is influencing her behavior and more. So now before we get into this recap, I ask that you all please hit the like button on this video. Even if you were to hit the dislike button, either one of those work the same, meaning that YouTube will recommend this video to more people who enjoy discussing love and marriage Huntsville. And if you have not already done so, please subscribe to Show Style and Spirit. I would definitely love to have you as one of the show stoppers. And everything that I'm saying in this video is alleged and just my opinion. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, just a heads up, I will be reading some notes because I took a lot of them, but definitely I'll be sure to connect and look in the camera, right? All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, of course, the episode opens up with Stormy preparing to turn herself in to the police after learning that she has been charged for how she handled Miss Black Titanic and her friend Shay being in the parking lot of her warehouse. And so if you did not see that video for some reason, it is on Miss Black Titanic's YouTube channel. Definitely go there and check it out. She walked up to the warehouse door, but remain in the parking lot. Courtney came out initially. He asked them to leave or asked why were they there, I should say. And then Stormy came out. She took over the situation and she was very upset, yelling and cursing. And then Shay and Miss Black Titanic left. And everything was recorded by both Miss Black Titanic and Stormy was streaming it as well. So um, Stormy was getting, you know, her um, hair done, her unit and her makeup. She said if she was going to have a mug shot that she definitely wanted to look as best as she could. Her mother-in-law, Miss Beasley, came before she went to jail to turn herself in. She gave her a hug and said that everything was going to be OK. And, you know, I'm sorry that this is happening to us and everything that happens to you affects me. You're like my daughter. We're family. Very supportive and encouraging words. Things that Stormy was hoping to get from her mother and her mother could not provide any emotional support. I think that that's very pathetic of Betty. When Stormy told her mother-in-law you know, when I reached out to my mom, she said, that's what you get for being on a reality TV show. Miss Beasley said, oh, wow, that was a natural reaction. How I know it was because then she immediately pivoted to, well, you know, um, I'm going to always be there for you. You know, she kept giving her encouraging words. She did not want to seem judgmental of that lady, probably because she has already peeped how negative Betty still is, in my opinion. But I thought that that was very supportive for Stormy's mother-in-law to show up. And um, she seems like she's an empath, you know, or at least has the emotional intelligence to give encouraging words to her daughter-in-law. And I thought that that was very important. Now, we're going to, of course, circle back to Betty Steele's behavior. And I have my own theory behind it. So we're definitely going to get to that in a moment. Um, her team, her glam team, they were supportive. The young lady in the blue jean jacket did Stormy's hair. And she said, did you try to center yourself this morning? Whether that's through prayer or standing in the mirror and saying your affirmations or meditation, you know, whatever it is that kind of calms your nerves, puts you in a positive mindset gives you strength to tackle the day. You know, her uh, hairstylist was encouraging Stormy to do that. And sometimes when you're so anxious about something, you may not really have the focus to do the things that you need to do, right? You're kind of in survival mode, plus you're nervous about the thing that's bothering you or on your mind. So then it's hard to do those things to center yourself. So you really have to focus 
focus to focus on those things that could really be beneficial to you mentally and um, emotionally. But this scene, even without Betty Steele, really shows, um, is very telling about Betty Steele as a human. All right, so let's move right along. So then we have a scene between Destiny, Trisha, and Tisha. They all meet up at a shop where you can make candles. If you follow Destiny on her Instagram or on her YouTube channel, she has launched a home fragrance line with candles. So this was her way of introducing her home fragrance line in this scene. Very generous of Carlos King and Kingdom Rain, but so Tisha was wearing like this military fatigue jacket with some really short shorts. I believe the jacket was, you know, the same length as the shorts are slightly longer. And it looked like she had boots that came above the knees. So it looks like she was ready for the club or like a sexy photo shoot to give the photos to Marceau. But no, she hung out at a shop where you can make candles, but you know, whatever. And, you know, Trisha was wearing like a tank top with a brown belt and jeans, you know, um, nice, nicely fitted, shows off her physique and, you know, just really laid back and appropriate for making candles. While they were doing that, they recapped the gala that Stormy threw and Destiny was talking about how Sonny and Moses attended. And she tried to make so, uh, Sonny feel insecure by saying that Moses is sleeping with or has slept with, you know, everyone in St. Louis. And she said that Moses just stayed away from her, but he kept staring at her the entire time. And Destiny told the ladies that she's confident that if she wanted Moses, that she could take him back. I don't know if she could have him back like wholeheartedly. But whether or not he could possibly be open to messing around with Destiny while married, you know, anything's possible. Unfortunately, it just seems like human beings struggle with commitment, just in my opinion. And that's not for just Moses, but humans and men as a whole. So, you know, I feel like that was a fair statement when she said that. She has had similar sentiments when Dr. Heavenly interviewed her. So that's definitely how she feels. Now, um, that was pretty much that scene. Nothing really else to say after that. I feel like, you know, um, production was being generous and letting Destiny promote her home fragrance line. Um, this episode, we did not see Maurice or Kimmy Scott as well as Melody. Melody was definitely missed, at least for me. Um, I was in Kempire's chat and I was saying, you know, like I missed the early seasons of this show. I even said that to someone who commented on one of my videos this weekend. I said, you know, I missed the first two seasons of Love and Marriage Huntsville. Those are my all time favorite. But I just miss like the authenticity of it all. Like those early seasons, you could tell that they were weaving their way through reality TV, getting to know being on a show. But their conversations, their opinions, their life situations, that was all happening in real time and the real deal. Holy field. OK, shout out to Snoop Dogg. So uh, that's what I miss so much about this show are those first couple of seasons. You know, and I say that because, you know, even when I recap the episodes, there's nothing like special or stands out for me. So I just really miss those older seasons. But, you know, I guess time goes on. Right. So then we see um, Stormy and Courtney leaving the jail. So I'm going to go back to my notes now. So Stormy said that she was in jail for 15 minutes. During those 15 minutes, Stormy had a panic attack and she called on guards. They did let Stormy keep her cell phone. And Stormy said that the police was nice to her. So she did want to acknowledge that they were professional and they were kind to her. I'm glad that she had a pleasant experience with the police, especially being black and a woman. I'm glad that she did not have an experience of being, you know, violated or roughed up or anything like that. 
I'm sure, you know, they were aware because of the charges that she's on a reality TV show. I feel like at this point, Madison County Jail, the law enforcement officers, they're probably very familiar with Love and Marriage Huntsville. So they they knew not to be rough with her. And plus her husband, Courtney, was there as well. So they were also talking about Stormy was still like, what do you think about my mama? You know, and Courtney said, what about her? And she said, you know, she she didn't say anything supportive to me. She said, that's what you get for being on a reality TV show. Courtney said, you need to let your mother know how you feel. Stormy said, I don't have anything to say because she won't care. Courtney says, still let her know. What do you all think about that? I feel like everyone who disrespects you and um, doesn't give a damn, a lot of them are going to keep that stance. They're going to keep that same energy. If you were to let them know, you know, I felt disrespected when, or I did not like it when, well, however you choose to tell them. That could be hurtful or make you feel even more disrespected if you try to tell them your feelings and they just don't give up, you know? So I kind of say, in my opinion, when you are facing a person like that, if you can really move on without needing any sort of validation from them, you don't need them to acknowledge your hurt feelings, you do not need an apology, I say take that route. And that seemed to be the mindset that Stormy was kind of having, but Courtney was like, no, you let her know. You know, and then I also feel like you need to ask yourself with you wanting to let somebody know, is that coming from a place of pride? Do you feel the need to tell somebody off and I'm going to let you know how you feel? Like when so many people say, I made her speak. She was trying to ignore me and I made her speak. I would always think to myself, that's so foolish. They're, they're just saying hi because they're keeping their peace. They don't feel like having a scene with you. They don't think that you're worth arguing with and getting all upset and making a fool of themselves. So when you think that you made someone speak, they really just protected their peace. I just don't see the purpose or how it enhances your life to make someone speak. But that's just me. That's my opinion. So then we see where Trisha meets with her sister, Ebony, and Ebony is very shocked to learn that Trisha and her husband have been separated for four years and Trisha has been living with Ken. Now, I wonder how Trisha was able to keep this a secret, you know, to live with a man for nearly a year and your sister doesn't know, you know, that's giving Trisha and Ken, they must not really have gatherings at their house where they're inviting family over, or perhaps Ebony is a homebody and she wouldn't show up anyway, because I'm just curious as to how Trisha was able to keep that a secret, even if Ebony is just coming over to play cards or watch a movie for a couple hours, like if she doesn't get an inclination that they're living together, that would seem interesting to me. So that was just something that popped into my head. I don't really think it's significant sort of kind of i was just like wow how did trisha pull that off keeping that a secret for a whole year they must don't really have at least trisha's side of the family over for any sort of gatherings for her to like keep that from her sister for that long you know i don't know but um ebony was shocked and ebony was actually concerned that trisha kept huge secrets from her and I think that Trisha was keeping it a secret because of uh, due to people pleasing. In Trisha's confessional, she said that her family is very traditional. So she was not expecting them to support her being in a relationship while she was still legally married. And on top of that, she's living with the side dude. My apologies, Ken, but you know that is kind of what you are. You are dating a woman who's married. So I have to say that I feel like because Trisha was focusing on how she was raised, you know, that was why she was keeping it a secret. And, you know, um, yeah, 
Trisha, if you don't really like Ken, you need to like let him know. The thing is, is that like you live with him, your kids know him. You know, it seems like everybody's getting mixed signals, girl. I don't know what I don't know what to say. Like I and I I'm not a mom. I don't have any kids, but I just wouldn't want like a guy that I know I'm not really serious about. I wouldn't want him around the kids full time and we're living together. And then I just think about people's mental state. You don't know how folks may handle, especially today with everything that happens to black women when they try to get out of relationships. It just seems like such a gamble, you know? But, you know, she knows Ken better than I do. But um, it's just, there's something off about this entire situation. I feel like uh, Trisha holds a lot in, or you, I don't know, it's just something odd there. But uh, this, this was the scene with her sister, Ebony. So if there's anything else that comes to my mind um, about this situation, I'll just verbally say it. But it is, you know, it is very different. All right, so then the fellas get together to uh, go bowling. We have Martel, Chris Fletcher, Ken, and Courtney. And um, we know Courtney doesn't F with the Scots, okay? He does not F with Marceau or Maurice. I cannot say that I blame the guy. I felt like these four guys, they had cool chemistry. You know, it was giving the hangover. You know, it was giving like, you know, four roommates in the dorms that decide to go bowling, you know, a little Beavis and Butthead energy, you know what I'm saying? And um, I felt like Ken, okay, so Ken let Martel know that Trisha did not like Martel acting like he did not know her. Martel acted really weird when Chris asked, how did he know Trisha? He said through his brother, he was like, well, my brother knows her. And then, you know, the, the men kept uh, probing and he said, well, you know, I, I also know her from being out. You know, he was talking very vague and Courtney just called it right on out. He said, you know, Martel needs to stop talking to so many women. And Courtney also said, you're not telling the entire story. This is another weird layer to Trisha. There's an awkwardness with Martel when it comes to discussing Trisha. Even before Ken arrived, he was the last person to arrive out of the four men. Martel was kind of like, okay, here we go. His facial expression once Courtney told him that Ken was attending also. You know, it's giving, just in my opinion, that they have been intimate, that they have smashed. And they're trying to keep it a secret. I think that Martel does not want Ken smoke. He does not want to get into a physical altercation with this guy. So he's definitely trying to fly under the radar. Ken is actually, you can tell he's like preparing himself mentally for it to come out that Martel and Trisha have done something. Because in this scene, Ken was saying things like, I'm not insecure. I'm a secure guy. And I don't care about what has happened in the past. And he says, you know, Trisha is a pretty girl, you know, but what if it's more like the present, Ken? What if it's more like the present? What if she is cheating? Chris Fletcher even asked in this scene, he asked Ken if he and Trish were going to get engaged. And Ken said, well, I don't ask because she's still married. And then Martel said, so wait, you're the side dude? And then Chris Fletcher just starts cracking up. Chris Fletcher, he's sort of kind of like, I know that they're men, you know what I'm saying? Because I was telling myself like, Ebony, they're dudes, so they're going to act like themselves. But it almost seems like Chris gets a little goofier or he like reduces himself to come down to Martel's level. You know what I'm saying? Because I was like, isn't that funny for him to be like the side dude? Y'all should have given like an awkward silence so Ken can wake up. You know what I'm saying? But instead, Chris Fletcher laughed. And then Ken said, well, if I'm the side dude, I'm the best side dude ever. And then Martel like gave him a play, like, like some dap, you know? And 
I'm like, we can't be okay with a man being the side dude. We have to give him just as much energy as we do women when they are the side chick, in my opinion. But they made light of it. But, you know, men, they're going to stick together, right? That's exactly what it was giving. But there's something there. There is like an awkwardness and an oddity about Trisha. And then Martell is the added layer of awkwardness. So I'm just going to go back to my notes. I want to make sure that I did not forget anything about this scene. That was pretty much it for the men. It was it was a playful, cool scene. You know, they were play, they were uh, bowling. They were having a good time. They said loser buys food. We never got a definitive answer on who lost. But uh, it was a good scene. So then we see Stormy meet with her mother, okay? So the episode ends with Stormy talking to her mom, Betty. Stormy is planning on using a surrogate to have another baby. We've heard her kind of mention this, you know, to Courtney before during season six. This is giving storyline for the second half of season seven, as well as the first half of season eight, because it takes nine, 10 months for a baby to cook in the oven. So I imagine, because we know that the cast is filming right now. So I bet they're filming a stormy meeting with a specialist about the process, perhaps meeting with a woman who would potentially be her surrogate. And then we're going to probably see somewhat, I guess, of the procedure and then, you know, whatever they can show us or them going to the facility. And then over the next season or so, we'll see, you know, her preparing to have another baby. You know, that's going to be her storyline for at least a season and a half. But that's what I thought of when they were talking about it. And Betty brought up how, you know, especially because with all of Stormy's complications from having chest, that she would rather her use a surrogate because she says because of like the reversal of Roe versus Wade, lawmakers do not even care about women's health. And like I I feel like Betty, she comes off very negative and harsh, but I was glad at least that that soundbite made it to the episode because that's definitely something that cannot be talked about enough. So then Stormy brought up how Betty wasn't there for Stormy when she had to turn herself into uh, law enforcement. Betty said that, you know, I have an 80-year-old mom living at home, so I definitely want to take the moment out and acknowledge the fact that Betty is a caregiver. So I get it that she cannot just up and leave from her home in Mississippi to go to Alabama on the fly. I do give her that acknowledgement. However, there is a polite way to say that. And in addition, you know, like, I'm sorry, a daughter, that I can't physically be there for you, but I'm going to follow up. I'm going to follow up with Courtney, see how you're doing. And you know that you'll be in my prayers and I love you. Nobody is perfect, you know, and everything will work out fine. You don't have to say this, what you get for being on reality TV. Everything is not about a read or hoeing someone, especially when you carry them in your womb for nine months and literally push them out of your body. Have some sort of connection with the girl, okay? That's why she called you because you are her mother and she needed some motherly support. I'm going to talk more about that um, in a moment. So, Stormy said, you know, um, you were harsh. You were hard. I'm paraphrasing. Betty goes, well, that's how you took it. Now, um, of course, I'm no therapist. I've been to therapy. And when someone says, after you express to them how you feel, how they made you feel, when they say, well, that's how you took it, they are trying to manipulate you. They are trying to take what they did and put it back on you. You are hurt because of you. That's your problem. That is manipulation. That is them not taking ownership for a mistake that they made with you. And they're trying to put it back on you. That's a form of manipulation. And, you know, don't let folks get away with it. You know, when you know that somebody rides like that, that's why I say don't even bother trying to have these types of conversations because they're just going to try and manipulate you into thinking that something is wrong with you or that you're lacking because you feel disrespected. 
So Betty then tried to deflect by bringing up Stormy going to jail when she was 18 years old. And as a result, Stormy met that energy. She said, well, when I got married, you were late. Betty was like, well, I wasn't late. If people were still getting their makeup done, Stormy was like, you were late. So when Betty tried to judge her, Stormy met her, was saying, was judging her, you were late for my own marriage. So Stormy is at the point where she has learned Betty's game and she can even match that energy. Again, I'm a fan of, you know, if you know somebody going to play games with you, first they disrespected you, then they try to manipulate you when you speak up for yourself. Don't even bother with those people. They're not even worth it. Betty thinks that she comes off so tough and hard by saying such harsh, mean, rude things to people, but really she's showing that she has very deep issues. She needs therapy in the worst way. and She really needs to let down that guard with the therapist and talk like who was rough with her. Okay. Oh my gosh. Who, who was so tough with you, Betty, and did not uh, validate any of your feelings, honey? Oh my gosh. But um, then Betty deflected some more. This is when she brings up Melody. And she said that, you know, Betty accused Melody of activating the millimeters using the word activate to get them to attack her. She said, anytime I say anything about Melody, these people attack me. Whoa, 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 whoa. There is defending Melody. There is trying to get people to understand the facts about whatever situation they're talking about. And then she said attack. And then she said, you know, they're calling retailers. Well, not all millimeters have called retailers that sell Stormy's products. The majority of millimeters are not calling retailers about Stormy's products. The majority of millimeters are too busy buying Melody's products. So I, I feel like that's Cap. And she was trying to deflect from how she made Stormy feel. Thankfully, Stormy remained focused. She said, regardless of what you feel about the fans, when I called you because I had to go to jail, I still needed you and you were not there. So after that, Betty knew that she could not manipulate this girl. This lets me know that when Stormy was a kid, when she was a young adult, perhaps if she's ever had lower self-esteem, Betty was able to manipulate her mind, cause confusion, and get her to back down. But Stormy remained focused on what her mom did that hurt her feelings. And after she tried to use Melody in the millimeters, then she said, well, you know, I don't apologize. And then Stormy goes, why can't you just apologize? It's not that big of a deal. And then at the end, she did say, I'm sorry. I'm going to circle back to that apology. I want to first say that Betty's dislike for Melody is so strong that it impacted her ability to give motherly support to her daughter. Her dislike for Melody is so strong that she could not emotionally support her daughter before she had to go to jail. That is really deep. That is a very strong dislike. And that is something that Betty needs to address within. My gosh, your dislike for Melody is literally spreading out and affecting others. I think that's insane. And when she finally apologized to Stormy, it made me think of a term, a term that I also typed in Empire's chat, growing up while black. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Shout out to the plainest Jane. She is a very intelligent black female YouTuber. And um, she reports on stories that impact the black community. Definitely check her out. And, um, she had a segment, you know, growing up while black. And she talked about how, you know, if you acted up in church, that was like a federal crime, you know, and I have stories. I have friends of like 
they're outside playing with their siblings. And you know how with kids, they'll constantly come in and out. It's hot outside. They want something to drink. The flies are bothering them and they keep coming in and out. And that door is aggravating. One of my friends, you know, her sister was the one going in and out. She went in one time to use the bathroom and she got the whooping. And it was the wrong kid. And, you know, black parents don't always want to apologize. There's even a meme out there on the Internet. And it says black parents way of apologizing is come on and eat like they just fix you dinner. You know, that's their way of saying I'm sorry. So I had these thoughts while watching this scene when Betty finally apologized. After she tried to gaslight Stormy and say, well, that's how you took it. After she tried to deflect and judge Stormy and say, well, you went to jail when you were 18. After she tried to use Melody and the Melometers for her not supporting her daughter. Then she says, I'm sorry. Growing up while black child, it is a lot, okay? And then some elders, not all, but some elders feel like they... They don't have, have to ever apologize to someone younger simply because of the age gap. That is ridiculous. Respect is respect and respect is earned. That is, it, it's just so exhausting. So I know Courtney is just thanking God that Betty lives in Mississippi and that she has her elderly mother with her to take care of her because she does sound like she's pretty occupied. But, you know, Betty probably also stays away because when his mom comes around, her positive energy, I'm sure, aggravates her negative energy. Child, this was deep and crazy to me, but I know that a lot of you are blacking out. So at least, you know, you do have a sense of what happened in the episode. Um, for all of you who checked out the episode, what did you think about it? Again, I do miss Melody and it's, I even want more. I don't just want to see her in one scene, you know, chit chatting with Tisha and Kimmy. I want like that girlfriend, like where I'm cracking up, it's giving sex in the city. You know, I want like those confessionals where they are giving the real, you know, I get it that things changed. I know we're not going to get those first two seasons again but I miss that authenticity. I miss Melody Cherie, you know, and we'll just have to see uh, what happens, you know? But thank you all so much for checking out this video. I always appreciate the support. Please hit the like button on this video as it is a free way of supporting the channel. And please subscribe to Show Style and Spirit if you have not already done so. It is Sunday. I've already grocery shopped. I've made some content. And um, I got out and saw some friends, um, like a, a, a elder at the church passed away. So, you know, like I went to the funeral home and fellowshiped. I saw my God dad. He was there. So, um, you know, hugged some people that I deeply care about and, and had some conversations. Then I came home and made this content. So it's just so funny. Like um, I'm at a point where like. I've studied, you know, the Bible for myself and I have lots of memories of always volunteering in church and being in different groups. And then you get to a point where you don't want to like be a people pleaser, you know, and I'm just over like people um, always scrutinizing, you know, like what you wear or if you're shapely, you know, they some some people, not all, not all just some people being judgmental. So it makes me stay away. And then people ask, where, where have you been? I pray that you come back, you know, and we uh, sang songs and prayed and, you know, they had devotion because um, Brother Slaughter was def you know, heavily involved. So um, it, it felt really good. And that, um, that natural ability to get back into it just comes to me very easily. So it's like, um, I guess I'm at a crossroads, you know, but um, I just feel like it could be so much more. Spirituality could be so much more for so many people if there wasn't so many judgments and people just worried about what you're doing and what you look like and this, that, and the third. But um, it's definitely Sunday night. So be sure to prepare for the work week. It will not be a manic Monday. It will be a magnificent Monday. 
Be sure to do whatever you can to calm you. You know, I kind of don't like facing Monday, but once Monday evening comes, I'm like, I can exhale. It's like I'm waiting to exhale from Sunday night all through Monday. But, um, you know, if you go in the office, lay your clothes out tonight. If you eat overnight oats for breakfast, just go ahead and make it. You know what I'm saying? Don't forget while you're watching your favorite YouTubers, drink your water, eat your fruit, you know, get that out of the way. You'll feel proud of yourself. If you know your favorite content creator is about to go live in 30 or 40 minutes, go take a quick walk outside before they go live or, you know, do your cooking or put a load of clothes in the wash. Have that balance between being productive and enjoying your entertainment. Well, I will talk with you all very soon and you take good care. Bye.